I don't really know how to start shows. Come on now, don't start, don't start liking me now. So yeah, I'm funny compared to you know. Well, you'll see later. I stand for my help. I know a lot of fucking idiots who think a lot of shit is mean spirited just because it goes against what they believe. But the relief of comedy is to take things that aren't funny and it allows us to laugh about them for an hour. We got a purple suit to buy and a gigantic coffin. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why You Laughing, a history of comedy podcast. And today, I'm pleased to introduce you to Jackass, possibly the most successful series MTV has ever done, as well as uh, a movie that has gotten a lot of credit over the years. It's funny because we'll talk about some of the restrictions they dealt with um, over 20 years ago. And then um, Jackass Forever, their fourth film, came out a year ago at this time. And you would hear a lot of people talk about how it's nice to have something that's purely funny that no one can really complain about. So the, the both the franchise and society have really uh, come a long way since the early days of Jackass, but we will uh, get into all of it right after I remind you that if you want bonus, why are you laughing content? If you want these episodes a week early, if you're like, Mike, I can't wait till next week for the next episode, um, then go to the Patreon. And the easiest way to find the Patreon is at blindmike.net. Um, that's also where you can get the free links to the podcast. If you'd rather support the show that way, whether it be Apple, Spotify, YouTube, you name it. Um, and, uh, best way to support the show in that form, would be leaving a five-star review, subscribing on YouTube, liking, uh, all of that good stuff. And then, you know, once you decide, once you're comfortable with us, if you want to join the Patreon, you're welcome back there as well. So. Uh, by the way, last couple months for why you laughing seemed pretty good. So hopefully uh, people are enjoying it. And uh, we're also doing bonus why you laughing content, as I've mentioned before. Um, I, I think we'll probably do a follow up to that Opie and Anthony episode on Patreon in February. And I think sometime next week, uh, you guys should also have, um, or maybe it's already up, depending upon when this comes out. Um, a mini episode involving Pablo Francisco, who is a, an odd character and had a um, hilarious slash frightening meltdown <laughs> um, in, in Sacramento at a comedy club a few years back. So we'll be looking into that at some point on the Patreon as well. So these are all reasons for you guys to get back there. So do that now and then come back to the podcast. Yeah, they're doing it right now, I bet. Yes, I, good. I told them to. So they, they listen. <laughs> Um, you're a big jackass fan, yes, Craig? Yes, yep. Uh, you know, it's fine. I, I don't know that I really got into them until the movies because they were so like ingrained in the culture that I thought you had to be a specific guy to enjoy them. You know, even as a kid, I was like, oh, I don't know if I fit this stereotype. Like, jackass had kind of a culture associated with them. And that stems from really the beginning, the pre jackass days, um, which, uh, you know, I was listening to like Steve O and Johnny Knoxville, which will play a lot of clips of them um, talking about how a lot of it is just attributed to skate culture in general yep. and skating, skateboarding. And I mean, extreme sports as a whole, you know, like the X games and uh, motocross and BMX and all that. But really I would say centrally focused on skating has the biggest culture associated associated with it of any sport, I think. Because even, like, golf has a culture around it. You know, it's a, a gentleman's game, as they say. But then, like, you know, when you leave the golf course, you take off the khakis and uh, collared shirt. <laughs> Whereas, like, growing up in high school and everything, at the time that we did, um, skating was a culture that you you lived. <laughs> and then even beyond that, there were uh, like, you know, the posers that would wear uh, billabong t-shirts and like those, and when I was in high school, um, where those big black shirts were popular, like the Robin big shit. Mm -hmm. um, so like there, there was a, an entire, you know, the way you dressed, the way you acted, the way you talked. Uh, if you were a skater, it was all like you were your own stereotype essentially. And in the eighties, when skating started to get popular, uh, a lot of that culture was controlled by like soccer moms, essentially. Um, and, you know, we'll mention from time to time, um, like NWA because of the stuff that they went through with censorship and Tipper Gore and all of that. Um, skate culture in a way dealt with the same thing, 
because my parents in general, but particularly like moms kind of controlled, um, you know, what their kids couldn't, couldn't watch on TV, especially that, you know, before the internet and everything. Um, and so a lot of, uh, skate content was censored and, you know, like, uh, Tony Hawk, who's probably the most popular guy to ever come out of that world is a very like family friendly, non controversial type of guy. Um, but you know, there were underground, uh, uprisings in that world as well. And the roots of Jackass go back to a guy named Steve Rocco is uh, someone that they all credited. And he ran a magazine called big brother. And Steve Rocco was a guy um, that went out of his way to do the opposite of what, you know, moms uh, of skater kids wanted. He didn't want to be associated with the skate videos that were for sale in your local blockbuster or whatever. So he would go out of his way to do, you know, crazy extreme shit. Kind of the, in a way, the Howard Stern of the, uh, or, you know, the Eminem uh, later, Marilyn Manson of that skating world, Mm -hmm. where when you look back at it, some of it might look douchey. You know, like you just got a machine gun on the hood of a car or something. Yeah. (laughs) Like what a douchebag. But at the time, he was like sending a message and being really edgy and creating something, you know? Yeah. They were talking about, uh, I don't think we clipped uh, this part, but they were talking about how most skate videos were trying to appeal to like parents and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Because that's who bought the stuff. Right. It, so it wouldn't show like the hard falls and like all that stuff. Oh, that's Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. Even that stuff I'm talking like, I was talking about like the extreme shit, but yeah, it started with parents not wanting their kids to see like injuries so Steve Rocco basically said injuries. <laughs> I'll like pull out my dick and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll really go nuts. Um, so yeah, you're right. Like you know, the parents kind of controlled that shit because they didn't want skate videos to be too dangerous. Right. And Steve Rocco is a guy who a lot of people realized this at the end of the '80s into the '90s that if uh, you are putting out a product that kids like enough, it doesn't matter how insane it is. If your kid bothers you enough, you will buy that content. Right. You know? If you have an annoying enough kid, you're going to buy him a M&M CD, no matter how filthy it is. <laughs> um, and so Steve Rocco capitalized on that. And then uh, that brings us to our first clip where um, we have Steve-O kind of breaking down the early days of how what I'm talking about started to evolve into uh, uh, Jack. I think this is Johnny Knoxville um, uh, or before Johnny Knoxville, actually. So I made it my business to just do stunts so that I could be in skateboard videos, but not as a skateboarder. And I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico to live with my sister, and that's when I went hard with it. Fire and flying off buildings and just handstands on moving cars. And all the while, Steve Rocco was just becoming more and more powerful. And he got more and more crazy. So to promote World Industries, he would make these insane ads. And one of them was of a little kid holding a gun to his head and the two biggest skateboarding magazines Thrasher and Transworld both sent the ad back to him saying look there's no way we're going to run that and he said oh you don't like my ad well how about this I'm not going to take any more ads out in your dumb magazines I'm going to start my own magazine and that was how Big Brother magazine started for the purpose of being naughty Big Brother would be the place that brought together all of the characters you would come to know from Jackass. And so you like you'll hear that like a kid holding it. You're like, why? Yeah, yeah you're also like, yeah, I understand why they were like, no. <laughs> yeah, why? Why are you doing that? <laughs> they like, you know, when he said that, it reminded me of uh, the Nirvana album cover where it's like a naked baby or something. Yeah, and it's like you know, thirty years later, we can look at that and be like. Why would you do that? <laughs> why, would you, why would you put them on there? But at the time, it was them, like, you know, sending a message and pushing back. Now, there would be an argument to the fact that uh, maybe we went a little too extreme in the 90s. Maybe maybe the fun we had in the 90s is the reason uh, for some of the bullshit that happens now. But you kind of got to respect them wanting to send a message regardless of uh, what their tactics were. So that um, Big Brother magazine evolved into something like uh, Steve-O said that a lot of these guys invo- got involved with, including, uh, obviously, the great Johnny Knoxville. 
So Johnny Knoxville was a guy who wanted to get into like, well, he wanted to be an actor and he got into commercial acting a little bit, but never had, you know, crazy amounts of success. So he started writing and he would write for these magazines under the name Johnny Knoxville. Um, and uh, eventually he found his way to uh, Big Brother. Knoxville started showing up in Big Brother when he decided to do a review of self-defense equipment. The self-defense equipment was the first time in my life where I felt like I had momentum. He got shot with red pepper spray. Hit me! A stun gun. Charge! And a taser gun. Weren't you on 90210 not too long ago? <laughs> <laughs> and then actually put on a bulletproof vest and shoot himself with a 38 caliber handgun. Jeff Tremaine said, go ahead and make sure you video that because they also made videos which came out periodically to kind of color in the behind the scenes of it all. And so right there you hear the, even though in those half second clips of Knoxville that you, that we just played, you can tell like, okay, that's clearly the birth of Jackass. Mm. <laughs> um, and you know, I did. I, I shame on me for this because I didn't look too much. I was focused on Jackass. I didn't look too much into Steve Rocco beyond these Big Brother days, um, which I should have. I don't know why um, he didn't become more influential when they went down this path. So uh, shame on me for that. We should look at that up and uh, we'll have a follow up on the next episode. But this is where things kind of started to spin off and. Um, you know, they kind of developed the crew that came to be the jackass guys, right? Yep. That's what they did, man. They subtracted the skateboarding and what was left over was Knoxville, Wee Man, Steve-O, Pius. And then they added Dave England and Danger Aaron from Blunt Snowboarding Magazine, as well as Johnny Knoxville's buddy Preston Lacey, and joined forces with Bam and his CKY stuff, made a tape and called it Jackass. <laughs> And Dick House, the iconic production company, was born. <laughs> Dick House. It's a great the name. iconic production company. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And, I, you know, obviously, I think a smart business move. And I think the reason uh, Jackass stands out from a lot of the stuff that might have been happening in that scene is that they essentially ditched the skateboarding stuff. They would incorporate it in different ways and different sketches and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But not being a skateboarding show that does pranks strictly being a prank and stunt show makes it more mainstream. And that allows, you know, guys like me that don't give a fuck about skating so, to get into it. So I watched a, uh, a Bam Margera documentary one time. And even before this, when he was like really, really young, he would make skate tapes and show them to like the kids in his neighborhood and all that. And he, yeah. you know, when the skateboarding was happening, people weren't really paying attention, but when he put in stunts and sketches and stuff, right you realize that had the entire audience, not just so select yeah. few. It's interesting because every, essentially every other sport outside of extreme sports, athletes have zero sense of humor, mm -hmm. but I think, and you'll see this a little bit with MMA. Like you'll see MMA guys um, getting into like comedy and podcasting and stuff like that. And uh, I think there's something about, essentially uh, threatening your life at every turn that gives you a little more of a sense of humor than, you know, a, a basketball player or something. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, uh, all right. What's next? Um, I think, I believe this is Knoxville talking about them being tough guys. Oh yeah. So this is just a, a taste of, again, why I think they work because I kind of, you know, I think it lends itself to what I just said about athletes. There's um, like a, yeah, kind of an arrogant jock mentality, especially a lot of people that watch jackass were in high school and a lot of them were on the fringes. Like they weren't necessarily the popular kids in high school. Um, so the reason they were able to relate to that crowd is because they weren't like your typical jocks necessarily. They were, um, they came from the same place you did as a, you know, high schooler. Right. Exactly in character for you like when you started doing this stuff for big brother and like if a friend who you grew up with saw that would they be like there he goes again or would they be like whoa knoxville's like man what, you know, what out a of great control. question well I, awesome. I, you know honestly I, I just love the child man, child I, this is how um dumb i am also that my 
immediate instinct was to be like, listen to fucking Steve-O. Be like, you know, oh, wow, what a great... And then I was like, that is a pretty good question, actually. I'm intrigued to hear the answer. It is a good question, and he gets asked this kind of stuff all the time, and it's the first one he's been like, oh, wow, something new. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Like, whoa, Knoxville's like, man, what a, you know, what a great control. question. Well, I, I, you know, honestly, I was a little rambunctious, but I wasn't the most wild or rambunctious guy at the school. You weren't like, let's jump off the roof and let's fucking do this. No, not really. Yeah. So, so, but I mean, the, the, the people who knew you when you were in high school and grade school and they saw you on Jackass, were they like, wait, where did this come No, from? no, it wasn't. It's not a shock to them okay. because I was a, a loud mouth and, you know, was always in some, some kind of trouble. But, uh, it wasn't that big of a shock, but I wasn't the wildest or by far the toughest. But I mean, that's the thing about Jackass. None of us are that tough. Right. So it's like, I think that's what people can connect with this. We're not some macho guys out there trying to, uh, you know, uh, the, there is uh, an every man. Well, I mean, we are every man in. He loses his way at the end there, but you get what he's trying to say, I think. Right. And I, I just liked that explanation of it because I think it is why you were able to, like, as much as they were literally being jackasses, there was a re- relatability to them because, like, I could never put a, a hook through my fucking, a fish hook through my cheek <laughs> like Steve-O did or any of that. I can't relate to that at all. But then I can, re- what I can relate to is your buddies going, Jesus Christ. Right. <laughs> like them genuinely coming off as friends, um, I think is what made that show and set them apart from other people that try to do that shit. Like the ball busting element, if they weren't friends, you wouldn't be able to set up a punching bag that knocked Wee Man out <laughs> as he walked by. <laughs> right. But that was the that was the best part about the movies is because the show was kind of like, stuff pieced together the movies was them all in like the same spot yeah and if you want to talk uh influences they are like if the three stooges just had to keep going for 70 years yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is what it would have turned into eventually <laughs> yeah this is real three stooges <laughs> yeah um and like, i mentioned that uh like boxing glove thing the boxing glove that came out of the wall and punched you in the face. One of the funniest things. There's not a lot of like for me, because obviously it's visual. um, There's not a lot of like slapstick comedy that really gets me, Mm -hmm. but that I would cry. I could watch that 50 times. That and when uh, they had the giant hand that would swing around the door when someone walked through it and smack them. (laughs) It's just, it's childish and mean. (laughs) That was like, um, uh, Knoxville had a match at WrestleMania this year. I always watch WrestleMania still. And, uh, a lot of the, the, you know, the wrestling purists fucking hated it because they had like all these stunts going on during the match. And like, we man would pop out below the ring and then get like stapled or something. And they had one of those big hands and they used that as part of what it, and I was like, this is the dumbest shit, but I love every second of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you had guys like Steve-O who personified someone that just want, he talks a lot in about in his uh, documentary about getting sober, uh, demise and rise. It's called, it's pretty mm-hmm. good. Go watch it. Um, but he talks a lot about just wanting to be famous. He didn't even really care how. Right. And there's like a relatability to that almost because it, it is desperation, but it doesn't come off that way. It's almost like a charm that Steve-O had. And I think a lot of those guys kind of had that. Well, that's why he's docu- he talk- that's the one about him getting off drugs, right? Yes. Yeah. That, the craziest thing about that, though, is he would videotape every second of his life. So they yeah. just had so much footage for it. It was wild. <laughs> just doing nitrous. And yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. What's next? Um, this one we have is uh, their precautions. Yeah. I mean, this is just <laughs> some, some of the uh, some of the stuff they had to deal with on uh, on set. And we, and we learned that when Manny says uh, no. Like that means fucking no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Manny is, is, Manny is just, uh, I, I couldn't tell if he was like one of their guys or one of the studio's guys, but essentially he was a liaison to the studio. Yeah. You'd see and him like, on, um, on wild boys a lot. Okay. 
And um, uh, he was there for a lot of them. And like, as Steve-O just said, like, if he's saying no, then you know it's an absolute no from the studio. <laughs> Says uh, no. Like that means fucking no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If Manny's sketchy about it. Then it's like, all right, all right. Because when Manny says yes, that doesn't necessarily mean you're good. <laughs> <laughs> what was that when you were getting you were before the uh, you were hanging out over the alligator pit? And oh, what was yeah, his safety he, he plan? Says, <laughs> and he says, if an alligator gets a hold of Stevo, Stevo will relax, and hopefully the alligator will release him. <laughs> <laughs> it's just. Hilarious to be part of a thing where they're like, listen, I mean, fingers crossed the alligator is going to let him go. <laughs> I just like that they can have conversations where like, oh, do yeah, remember when you were hanging over the alligator pit? <laughs> yeah. Well, here's so here's the thing about jackass is like they were many, many times, you know, centimeters away from this being a much more tragic story. <laughs> oh, yeah. They get into that. Uh like they could be, this would have a much different tone to it, you know? Right. It's, it is pretty amazing that they got very lucky. Like obviously uh, Ryan Dunn passed away, but it wasn't from anything they were doing on set. Like it's pretty amazing that none of these guys died on set during the jackass run. No kidding. But uh, here's uh, here's them talking about how close they've come. Okay. Yeah, what, what, what are some of the other, like, just crazy, like, where we've got angels? I mean, I, I, I think about Jack as I really believe that oh, the we've rock, got, like... The rocket for... The rocket, Knox, yeah. The rocket. It not only almost killed me, but one rocket goes out back, like, 150 yards and goes right between... Cassick and Scott Manning's ear is just shut, and that would have decapitated one of them or both of them. It was a foot long metal rod. That was an angel. Um, the the steel wall falling on me at the end of Jackass number All two, because right. the the guy who rigged it is like, you get to your mark, don't move. It's a this is a <laughs> this is a steel wall. You will die if it hits you, and then. What happened that's was like, that's like Travis Pastrana telling you not to let go of the bike. I'm not, I'm not listening. Like before I do a stunt, I don't. Sometimes I, I you can be talking to me, but you can see in my eyes that I'm far away. Wow. <laughs> you know, I remember seeing the wall hit you, thinking like that was that was the bit. You know, like no, no, that wasn't supposed to happen. Wow. And uh, I remember on the set, I had had. Uh, my daughter come down because I thought this is like no one's going to get hurt today we're just <laughs> it's pretty casual mm -hmm. and then at that door that steel wall slammed me and it goes silent on the set except for Madison she goes dad what are you doing you idiot <laughs> and then everyone started laughing after that because you know I moved around a little so <laughs> well he's moving so don't worry about it but that's why like we're having a good laugh now but like, honestly, the, here's the crazy thing is like, I'm sure everyone has a story where it's like, yeah, it, you know, one thing goes wrong here. I could have died. And that's the thing you did where you're telling that story. These guys each have 50 examples of moments where, you know, one inch the other direction or one second later or whatever, they're dead. <laughs> right. So just given those odds, it's amazing uh, that they're all able to, tell the stories now. Uh, I mean, you know, like I said, Ryan Dunn's no longer with us. Uh, Bam is in pretty rough shape, which we'll talk about. But as far as, uh, you know, having all of their limbs intact, they've been pretty lucky. Extremely lucky. But like, uh, even to the point about how like it's like stunts and then slapstick, like one of the funniest things is seeing like Knoxville get hit by a bull and you, you're like, oh shit. And then he starts limping and turns around. And there's a big target drawn on his back. <laughs> like, <laughs> like stupid <laughs> shit like that is so funny. Yeah. And that, and that it's, it's an element of, and I think this was true of a lot more male friend groups at that. I don't know if it still is with like young kids, but like when I was growing up for sure, um, th there's been a label of like, frat guys or bros put to the way certain guys behave. But I feel like in the nineties and early two thousands, that was guys essentially <laughs> that, that was, that was attributed to guys. Right. Not, not like a certain brand of guy. Right. Because that is how, at least stereotypically, that's how guys 
busted balls was doing shit like that. They just did it at a level that none of us could imagine doing. Or yeah, they 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 took you know tripping someone when they walk by to the whole new level. <laughs> yeah. No, I will say, and again, this is probably a visual thing on my part. Um, but I like like when we talk about Opie and Anthony, I say that I actually didn't care for the shock jock stuff when they're like, Hey, there's a naked girl shoving something up her pussy. Yeah. Like that didn't really do a lot for me. I liked, you know, the ball busting element. That is more what I liked with Jackass also. Mm-hmm. Like, I think my favorite, I didn't include a lot of the sketches cause like I said, they're very visual. Um, but I think the best thing they ever did was, um, and I, I, I'm sure it had been done before, but I feel like I've seen it done the way they did it a lot since then, where you're pranking the guy who thinks he's the prankster. Oh, love that. Yeah. Meaning like, um, I forget which guy it was, but one of them was dressed as a terrorist. And, uh, <laughs> oh, no, it's that danger, Aaron. That's one of the funniest fucking yeah, things his ever. His beard was made of their pubic hair or yeah. something. <laughs> and... Uh, they make him believe he fucked with the wrong guy gets shoved in a trunk and driven around. <laughs> and he's like, Oh fuck. Oh, he thinks it went severely wrong when that was exactly what the prank was supposed to be. Uh, fun fact. The guy driving in that sketch is uh, Jay Chandra Sekar from broken lizard. Oh, no shit. Yeah. I'll have to go back and watch that. We'll do a broken lizard episode. At some point, oh, a lot of people would, request that would love that. I love them. Uh, all right. What's next? Uh, CKY. Yeah, so this is Bam. We'll get into a, a little more of the trials and tribulations of Bam Margera later. Um, but this is more basic stuff on the early days of uh, kind of what CKY was and how they joined the boys. Yep. I knew that, you know, if, if you look at CKY2K or CKY1, it's something that you could always watch because, dude, Skate videos just become so outdated. I remember watching Plan B questionable video over and over and over again because it was just such uncomparable to any other video. It was the best. Danny Way was the best. Uh, It was just uncomparable. And then now it's just they're getting better and better and better and better. And like, if you even watch questionable now, it's just tricks that kids could do for fucking breakfast, right. you know, but I mixed in funny, ridiculous stunts in between pro skate tricks. So it never gets old, you know, like you're always going to laugh and watch great skating, you know, um, which, which was completely brand new to, to, the whole skating sport. And when I played it to people that weren't skateboarders and they were laughing hysterical, telling everybody, everything was through word of mouth. It sold a million copies, you know, like, um, that, that's why like, you know, I mean, Tremaine always says big brother started jackets. Well, how come I sold over a million copies? Copies and Big Brother only sold like eighty thousand or something like that. Like he never gives me fucking credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's funny to look at and listen to a guy like Bam Margera and be like, he's a genius. But there, a lot of what he just said is really smart and um, you know innovative, and there's a lot of foresight there. Where he realized, like, hey, you know the further we go into skating, people are going to be able to do crazier and crazier shit. So now watching a trick that was, uh, or a stunt, whatever that in 1987 was cool in 1997, who gives a fuck? Whereas, you know, a guy getting hit in the nuts is always funny. It stands the test of time, yeah. you know? So, um, that was like very smart of him. And yeah, like a lot of those, um, guys were able to, uh, come together and be, you know, you hear uh, a little animosity at the uh, end of that from Bam, but for the most part, they were, they were, they were like brothers in a way. Yeah. Um, are we getting to the selling of the show now? Uh, this is Spike Jones. Oh, 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 the, another Bam clip. Uh, so Spike Jones is, uh, I'm sure you've heard the name. I think he, I forget, did he win the Academy Award or he was nominated for uh, the movie Her? So he's, you know, a guy who's, has a respected name in the business. Um, And Jackass kind of needed that. So this is 
Steve-O and Bam talking about Yeah, and if, if you're – another way, just so you know who Spike Jones is, when um, in the Jackass movies, when Knoxville's the old guy, Spike Jones is the old lady with the, the low-hanging boobs. That's Spike, oh, okay. That, that's Spike Jones. All right. I, I agree with you there, except for I think we got to acknowledge that it was Knoxville and Tremaine who reached out to Spike and got it going, and then they reached out to you saying, "Hey, do you want to come on board with this thing?" So how it, come how come Spike Jones has so much say in Jackass when he came in a decade later? Because he had the the clout the name the you know the the power to make this fucking thing start nobody else would have uh if spike's name wasn't attached to jackass in the beginning people would have looked at it and said you can't put this fucking shit on tv it's good that clear-headed steve-o was there for this conversation (laughs) Because oh, yeah. if it was uh, Steve-O in his crazy days, it would have just been two fucking junkies. Like, yeah, fuck him, man. <laughs> yeah, this is also when Bam was going through something. There's a there's a more recent sure. uh, episode with Bam on it, and he sounds a lot better. Um, but uh, basically, Steve-O's point was, and it's true, if they are just making videos of them doing ridiculous shit, then studios like HBO, by the way, are going to be like, the fuck is this? Because <laughs> even with Spike Jones, a guy who had kind of a name, um, <laughs> the uh, the legend is, as Johnny Knoxville has said before, that um, I think they had interest from Comedy Central, really wanted them. Um, SNL had interest, which I didn't, I never heard that before, but we'll talk about specifically what that was in a second. And obviously MTV um, but they also had a meeting with HBO and essentially just a, you know, the, the reader's digest version of this is that HBO was like, good Lord. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Which is weird when you look at like HBO being premium cable and comedy central and MTV being, um, basic cable. But, uh, I think they you know, when you're the network that eventually, you know, they would have the the Sopranos and the wire and these like respected shows, I guess it makes sense that HBO wouldn't have put jackass on, I suppose. Yeah. Especially back then. Yeah. Um, all right. Is there SNL thing next? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I never heard this. It makes a little more sense when you hear Knoxville explain it, but I, I did find it interesting. This was something I didn't know about you that when you guys put together jackass, you had an opportunity, you had a choice, put it on MTV or put it on Saturday Night Live. Yes, that would have been unique. And I'm surprised you went with MTV. Well, it would have been great to be on Saturday Night Live. It was a, a wonderful opportunity. I appreciated what a great opportunity it was. Lorne Michaels, did he meet with you? Yeah, we, we sat down at the Beverly Hills Hotel together and discussed it. I was going to get like three or five minutes on the show every week to do what I do. Wow. But at that point, we had, we were making the pilot for Jackass, and it was me and all my friends and, you know, Spike Jones and Jeff Tremaine, and I would have to leave that to do Saturday Night Live. And oh, they so, didn't want the whole crew. They just wanted you. Right. To do stunts on film. Pranks or stunts. No shit. That would have been very novel. They've never done anything like that. Yeah. So I, at the time in my ignorance, I, uh, once again, I'm like, I'm just going to bet on us. Right. And, but I respected what a great opportunity it was. I mean, he definitely took the right gamble. Oh, yeah. Although I will say pr- part of it, probably as much as he's like, Hey, I'm doing it for, you know, Jeff Tremaine and all these guys. I do think part of it was also, I'm sure he had a lot more control over what he could do with MTV versus what he could do with SNL. Um, which is not, it kind of came full circle because the impractical jokers guys who definitely heavily jackass influenced, obviously not with the physical stuff as much, Mm -hmm. but like there's definitely an element of jackass there in what those guys do. Um, they had a deal on the table with MTV. (laughs) And so this is how far MTV came in the 15 years after this. Um, they had a deal with MTV but MTV was going to essentially just buy it from them and recast it 
and have, you know, young hot kids basically <laughs> as the jokers. Um, and you know, so the impractical jokers guys said, well, it's, it's probably more money at the time, but like we have this deal with true TV where it's going to be us and true TV. No one knows what the fuck that is. And they're essentially saying, do whatever you want. You'll be the network. And right. sure enough, turn on true TV right now. Step, pause the podcast and turn on true TV. I will bet you Impractical Jokers is on right now. It's or or it's on the next. entire network. Yeah, it's that and then some of that weird like magician. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, they made the, the right call as well. Um, and, you know, so in a lot of ways, I think if you have a product you believe in like that, it is smart to uh, bet on yourself. Because I think, you know, Johnny Knoxville on SNL would have been like a novel thing that kind of ran for, you know, I don't know, four or five years. Mm-hmm. And now we'd be talking like, I ah, remember that guy who fucking stapled his nuts to a tree on Saturday Dude, I don't think it would have lasted a season. There would have been so many complaints. Um, see, I, I think it just would have been very watered down uh, or that I mean, the opposite that it would have lasted long. It just wouldn't be the stuff that we know as jackass, you know? Yeah. I don't think but he's going to shoot himself see... with a 38. That's definitely not happening. Right. That's not going to be on SNL. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do think it's interesting to hear that kind of thought process by Lauren Michaels because him saying like, Hey, I kind of want to do different shit where it's not necessarily live sketches. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think that kind of in a weird way opened the door for what Andy Samberg and the lonely Island guys did with those digital shorts. Right. Exactly. You know, obviously completely different yeah. in content, but right. I do think it's Lauren saying like, I just want something different to kind of break up the show a little bit. You know, I, re- I remember the first time I saw Jackass, I was at my buddy Ty's house and it was, it was them in full football pads, just tackling each other in public. And I thought it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that, like maybe that they could have done on SNL or maybe like some of the bad grandpa type of stuff. Yeah, that was that was getting totally away with. But again, they wouldn't have used, they wouldn't use the language they did on MTV or any of that. So right. it would have been a totally different product. Exactly. Um, what's next? Uh, Tom Green. I mean, we'd be remiss. We did a whole Tom Green episode. Yep. Um, for any new people, I recommend you go back and listen to it because that's where we discovered that Tom Green essentially invented everything. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that ever happened in Hollywood, Tom Green invented it. Um, so we talked a little bit about on there where um, Tom Green's problem. Not, it was not so much with the jackass guys. And I think that shines through in this. His problem was with the um, the network. And I think that kind of shines through when he's talking to Steve-O here. Uh, for you, Tom, like when jackass first came out, did you feel like, oh, these are my allies? This is like a progression of what I'm doing? Or did it feel like they were sort of taking what you did? I remember I went to like a screening of it. I at, remember uh, seeing you there. I was like, no way, off. that's Tom Green. But that was for the movie, not the series. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember it was, I think I was in New York when it first came out and I was kind of like, you know, I thought it was amazing. Like it was definitely different. I didn't think it was the same thing because you guys were kind of more like physical, more skateboard oriented too. like my show, like, cause I, I was a skateboarder, but I always kind of, we were, I was trying to do more like a David Letterman type show, you know, which, yeah. and you guys were definitely doing more of the, the physical stunts and stuff. And I do think that's kind of what we found when we talked about this in the Tom Green episode where his beef was not with these guys. He seemed to have like respect for what these guys did. It was more that he was bothered by like someone at the network obviously said like, Hey, Tom Green fucking woke his parents up with an air horn. What if we had these guys do that to each other? You know what I mean? It was shit. They might not have even known Tom Green did. Right. But someone at the network said, Hey, you should, you should do this. You know? Um, so yeah, a lot of influence they got from Tom Green, I'm sure, whether directly or indirectly, but it is, um, like that guy who's with Steve-O there, uh, like, I think he made an astute point that it was kind of a progression of what Tom Green was doing. Mm -hmm. And a lot, a lot of their influence too was from CKY. It's just, it's a slightly watered down version of CKY is what I would describe Jack as. I mean, ask Ben Margera. He'll tell us, you know. Yeah. I mean, I used to watch CKY when they were fucking VHS tapes and they they were gnarly. They also had offshoots. Like you mentioned uh, the Wild Boys. Yep. And uh, what was that? Nitro Circus and Uh, all that type of shit. Viva La Bam. 
Yeah. yeah. I, I actually, I, I didn't care for Nitro Circus, but the other, Wild, Wild Boys is maybe the funniest thing that that production company's ever done. <laughs> Um, what's next, sir? Uh, them talking about cracking down. Oh yeah. So this is, uh, based on some of the complaints they started to get. So uh, they aired on MTV in 2000, which I actually thought it was earlier. I didn't realize it was 2000. Mm -hmm. Um, but once they started, there was a little controversy behind the show, I guess. So we had some copycat incidences and where kids would get hurt. And that's what we didn't want. Right. I mean, we say don't try so we meant it because we don't want anyone to get hurt. We want to get hurt for you. <laughs> um, the Actually, the copycat incidences led to the downfall of the TV show. We were only on the air nine or ten months filming the TV show. And then there were some copycat incidences. And it was an election year and a senator named Joseph Lieberman, his, his platform was Be Tough on Hollywood. Oh, wow. Well. So, he came down on the network, the show, and me personally. Um, and MTV, you know, it's a big, you know, they're part of a big corporation. So they felt like they had to do something. So we got an uh, OSHA guy uh, assigned to our show telling us we can't jump up off anything any higher than four feet. Four feet? Yeah. And it's like, wow. do you know what we do? Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense to do it that way, you know, no. like that's just not what the show was. So, yeah. That, and, you know, that's the modern day version. It's so interesting when you look at the 90s because, you know, we'll talk about it from time to time on this show. Uh, the the role that uh, cancel culture and all that type of shit plays. Um, and now everyone's like hyper focused on it because it's about different groups and you're allowed to offend this group and not that group. Um, whereas in the nineties that still exists. It's not a new thing as much as like, sometimes we think it is, mm -hmm. it existed just in a different form where nineties, it was about like vulgarity and language and sex and nudity and that sort of shit. So it's just shifted like what, people are outraged and writing letters by and social media has obviously ramped it up a, a lot. Um, but they dealt with it as well. Um, you know, they dealt with it more than say like SNL at the time who was doing like racial humor and things like that. They were going to deal with that because no one really gave a shit in the nineties. Whereas, you know, sexual stuff or vulgarity that would get, a million letters. And that's what MTV would freak out about. Um, and so Johnny Knoxville kind of rebelled against that smartly. And it led to them, you know, being able to still do what they wanted to do. And in probably a better fashion. And uh, this is him talking about him quitting. Yeah. So he's, you know, um, kind of standing up for what he believes in. Like I said, it led to, uh, it was, it was a, it ended up being a smart play. It was very hard to do the show and Jackass is silly and absurd and, and dumb, whatever mm. you want to call it, but it means something to us. And yeah. it's like, we, I don't want to do the show a watered down version of the show. So I gave an interview to my hometown newspaper and said, I quit. That's and, very admirable. Though. MTV said you what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cause we were still under contract. Yeah. So there's a lot of back and forth. That's that's I, if you don't mind me saying, I think that's quite that's quite admirable though because I think like you am I right in thinking you were kind of just starting out on this journey back mm -hmm. then surely so a lot of people would have probably just carried on doing it under other people's terms just for the paycheck. Yeah, all we have is the truth on Jackass. Really, I mean, we have relationships, and which is a huge part of it. Our friendship mm. is probably the biggest part of it, and then we have all the stunts and pranks. But everything is real, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to give someone a half truth by doing a half ass job. Yeah, and you know why it's interesting? Cause like we just mentioned in practical jokers and I think that, you know, say what you want about in practical jokers. I like those guys and I think it's great. Like mindless television. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. It's perfect to put on in the background when you're half paying attention or you just want a silly laugh or whatever. I think that's kind of what it's perfect for, but if Jackass became Impractical Jokers, like if you saw a season of these guys, you know, putting on a bulletproof vest and getting shot <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, having a bull charge them or whatever the fuck they were doing in the first season, 
if you saw a season of that and, uh, you know, then in season two, they're like, hey, go up to this guy on the park bench and say something naughty. <laughs> and then having the same, like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you believe the Impractical Jokers guys are genuine because they seem like those type of guys. Whereas the, uh, the jackass guys, you're like, well, this doesn't make any sense now. You know, they're doing a G-rated version of what they did last year. So no one would have bought it. And I think the ability to have that, oh, I keep mentioning foresight, but like, you know, to, to realize that rather than like looking at the money and being like, let me just take an easy paycheck when Johnny Knoxville's nobody at that time, really. Right. You know, if Jackass just got canceled, Johnny Knoxville probably would have, I mean, maybe he comes up with another idea, who knows, but in all likelihood, he just goes away. We never hear that name again, you know? Um, so for him to say like, Hey, it needs to be done this way is pretty ballsy. And I think that's a common theme with people we're talking about. Like if you have a name that is respected in comedy, it means at some point you said you pushed back and said like, Hey, this needs to be done this way. Otherwise it just seems phony. Yep. Um, and here's him talking about, uh, getting the movies. Yeah. Which I ultimately, and he's going to talk about it here, but like. That's probably how it should have been done from the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Someone, I think, from MTV Films, David Gell, suggested that we do a film. Right. And Spike and Jeff, to their credit, said, yeah, we should do a film. And at, my, at the time, I was like, wait, are we going to have people play us? What is, what is the film? And they're like, no, we'll just do a naughtier version of the TV show. And... Oh, I like that. I, yeah. I I know how to do that. And that's where Jackass was truly, truly just. It's blown. what it was meant to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The TV show was fun and pretty good, but we really weren't so good at playing our instruments right. on the TV show. <laughs> I, I like, I remember like I was having trouble writing more ideas by the third season. Yeah. Cause I was like, what is like, I really hadn't landed on what it is. Mm hmm. But when we did the film, like I, and I think we got it and the ideas have been flowing. They, they haven't stopped ever since. Right. Uh, and I should say if the timeline is confusing at all, when he mentions three seasons, but they'd only been doing it eight or nine months, that might be confusing. They filmed the first three seasons, essentially all at once. Like they were ordered for three seasons. They filmed it over the course of nine or 10 months. And so that's how that timeline works out where basically by the time the first season was done, they already had complaints. And, you know, like you said there, the movie um, element was perfect where you could just um, live up to whatever standard an R rating gives you. But I will say without the TV show, it, it fell in place perfectly because if just, you know, a straight to DVD movie comes out called Jackass some people might find it. It might have a cult cult following. And then maybe as the internet grows, it catches on somewhere and grows a little more, but being on MTV really at like the height of its popularity, more or less like, you know, kind of just after the, the VJ era where they were starting to transition and just, you know, regular content rather than music videos. Um, being on that, channel allowed those movies to make uh, a shit ton of money and we're to the point where you have um, four sequels now. So yeah. Um, plus it, it fell into place very like they were, they were lucky in that sense, I think. Yeah. And one of the funniest sketches uh, I think they ever did was when uh, they had uh wee man and Preston on a bridge and they had wee man jump off strapped to him. <laughs> and it pulls them off, but like you can't have people jumping off shit like that on television. So it's just not going right. to work. Right. And then the language becomes more real when it's not on TV. Right. Um, showing any sort of nudity, not that there was a particularly sexy element to jackass, but any sort of like nudity <laughs> yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. Um, like that, it just makes it more real to kind of the point uh, Knoxville was making. Yep. And uh, now we move on to uh, Steve-O's sobriety. Yeah, so this is a big thing, too. Like I mentioned, Demise and Rise, which I believe premiered on MTV. At least that's where I watched it in uh, high school. Um, but yeah, Steve-O was a, a fucking madman. And he was doing uh, all kinds of 
all kinds of shit. Um, I think because like he felt like he had to in order to endure a lot of the shit that he was doing. Um, you know, but for a, a multitude of reasons, he got really crazy at the height of jackass. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is him talking about uh, kind of figuring that out and getting sober. Um, the involuntary hold that they uh, were legally entitled, you know, to impose on me was for three days. Mm-hmm. It's called 5150 and it's a 72 hour uh, hold. Yeah. But when I got to the hospital, I was spitting on people. I was just generally like so uh, unlovely that they <laughs> changed my status to 5250, which is a two week hold. So they had me uh, for two weeks. And um, it took about seven days for, uh, you know, certain things to happen. You know, some people came in and talked about recovery and, and uh, I read some stuff. And I just like, it was time. You know, yeah. my life was a disaster. And uh, I decided about seven days in that, uh, that I, I not only wanted to go into treatment, but that I didn't want to waste my time in treatment. That, uh, right. that I want, if I was going to make the commitment to get sober, I wanted to give myself every advantage and really uh, do the things that people do to stay sober. And thankfully, I've been committed to that ever since. So. Yeah, and he's been sober 14-ish years, 14, 2008, 2009, somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's really he made a turnaround, and he's a guy, uh, a celebrity who has gone into comedy that I actually reference all the time as someone who, like, I respect how they did it. And I always, he comes up a lot on uh, the Blind Mike Project when I compare him to Brendan Schaub um, because Schaub's a little more delusional in his approach. Uh, but Steve, I compare more to a guy like I didn't realize I'd be bringing up impractical jokers this much, but <laughs> Sal Volcano. Yeah. Um, where they're both like Steve is famous enough that he could bully his way on the stages, you know, mm-hmm. um, just because of his name. But he had respect for comedy and comedians and tried to do it the right way, which I think is a big deal um, as far as being respected in that world. But more importantly, Steve-O isn't a guy that thinks like, oh, now that I'm st- on stage, I have to start having, you know, astute observations about dating or, you know, right, <laughs> things like that. He's like, hey, I'll tell some stories and then I'm going to light myself on fire for you. <laughs> yeah. I, I know exactly what I am, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And so that I always uh, respected about Steve-O's approach and uh, getting into comedy. And uh, also check out the Blind Mike project because we played a great clip of Steve O addressing I was just uh, Brendan Shaw. Yeah, I was just going to say that was one of my might favorite. The funniest I've ever seen Steve O, actually. It might have been one of my favorite clips we've ever played. <laughs> but uh, well, let's, let's keep going here. Uh, yeah, here's where uh, Steve O got the call about Ryan Dunn passing away. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, this was. Uh, so. Do you know a little better? Because I remember when Ryan Dunn died, um, I don't even know that I knew who he was necessarily. Oh, yeah. Um, so like what? Tell the, the folks at home, who was he in the jackass world? Uh, he started at CKY with Bam. Um, he He's a jackass dude who sat, I don't remember, he, you remember the ice horse? He sat down with no pants on on an ice horse and then they pushed him off. Uh, that was a, a good That's one. That's the funny thing about jackass is you can <laughs> describe what they're doing and it sounds hilarious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> he, he did a bunch of stuff. He did the, he was the one that sat behind the jet engine uh, during okay. like, uh, you know, that whole thing. And yeah. he was always the guy that would do the shit that people didn't want to do. He was the one uh, on the show that jumped in the river of shit. Right. Uh, so he would do that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. And he died and that, that sort of approach is pretty much the reason he died in a way, right? He died drunk driving, going a million miles an hour. He, he was, I think he hit like 150 on like a fucking side road. Yeah. So um, very sad, obviously, but like not shocking. <laughs> yeah. You know? And that's why I did say, um, no one died doing his stunt, but like mm-hmm. that lifestyle in some form or fashion probably did attribute right. to Ryan Dunn doing that because he felt invincible. I'm sure. I you would. Know? I would say his most famous bit was uh, 
putting the, the toy car and the condom up his ass and then going to the doctors for an x-ray. Yeah. And when you do that, you think, <laughs> why can't I drive 150 miles an hour shit faced? I'm, in, I'm invincible. Yeah. So this is Steve talking about getting that call. My phone rang at like five or six in the morning and I woke up and it was someone from TMZ asking for a comment about Ryan Dunn's death. Mm. Which f***ing sucks. You know, I mean, I can't fault that person because they had my number. It was their job to, you know, to do that. It was, uh, I, I'm not mad at them, you know, for that. But uh, I, I was at the time. I thought that was pretty disgusting. It's pretty, I mean, I guess they, it's, I guess it is their job, but it is pretty shitty. There's no way you think Steve-O has heard about it by now. It was like two hours before that phone call. Or whatever the yeah. fuck it was, yeah. you know? So, of course, that's that's a horrible way to find that out. And by the way, I realize a lot of these clips are Steve-O. Um, he, he's in podcasting and everything. So that was the easiest source to find a lot of this shit being discussed. Mm -hmm. um, but like we, I was going to say at the beginning of this, like maybe uh, Steve-O would be a good episode. And then I realized I'm playing essentially all Steve-O clips. So <laughs> we're, we're pretty much doing it here. Yeah, and anything, anytime Jackass presented by Steve O yeah. essentially is the episode. And basically, any clip you can find about Bam talking about him because Bam and Dunn were best friends. Yeah. Um, it's not really worth playing. He's a mess. Coherent. Yeah. 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 Who gives a fuck, man? He was a. <laughs> I should have got top credit. Um. Uh, so we get to the roast now, right? Yeah, which this part, if you're uh, watching along, might not be in the final cut. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's a good point to say, make sure you go to the Patreon, folks, because our videos, any video that gets edited out on YouTube, um, particularly like Comedy Central and Netflix and uh, HBO, there'll be real sticklers about some of these videos. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to see the video because it's cut out for some reason, um, it'll be up on the Patreon. So make sure you go there. Yeah, it's, this one's short enough that it might make the cut, but who knows? <laughs> so... This is something that Amy Schumer, first of all, got famous for. She got famous from these roasts. Mm -hmm. But this is the first time Amy Schumer ever caught a lot of shit um, before she was very famous. And it's one I don't really understand, given the environment she was in. Um, but first, we'll play the joke so you understand what we're talking about. This is at the uh, Charlie Sheen roast. <laughs> And Steve-O is here. Steve-O, great try. Steve-O! That's funny. That is funny. But I truly am, no joke, sorry for the loss of your friend Ryan Dunn. I know you must have been thinking it could have been me, and I know we were all thinking, why wasn't it? <laughs> um. <laughs> so, I, A, I think that's funny, and I think she delivers it great. Yeah. Like, I think that's actually a good roast joke. Um, And I'm trying to think, like, he died that summer, I think. It was really short after. It, it was pretty, yeah, it was not that well. So I guess, you know, as they say, uh, tragedy plus time or whatever that expression is. Because um, I was like, sure, it's something like Rickles probably wouldn't have said in the uh, Dean Martin roasts. You know? <laughs> but we've come a long way since then. You know, things are different and people are joking about all sorts of horrible shit on these Comedy Central roasts. Uh, so that's in the news. So I don't think it's crazy that Amy Schumer mentions it. Now, the reason she took a lot of shit is because Steve-O, like the camera looks over at Steve-O and he's just like, what the fuck? Like the expression on his face was, he didn't love the joke, I don't think. I think Which is understandable. Was, yeah. But uh, I think he, he does a great job uh, explaining the backlash. He, he yeah, explains it here. And I, yeah, I completely agree with his take here. The clip of Amy Schumer saying that Ryan Dunn joke kind of went viral when it was like right. Chris Rock's I joke. Mean, let's, let's be clear that Amy Schumer was not uh, saying anything disparaging of Ryan Dunn. Sure. Her, the, the thing was that uh, she, you know, the, there was nothing like wrong about what she, she said. Oh, your friend died. And you know, that's so sad. But like I was along with everybody else thinking, man, why couldn't it have been Steve-O? Right. You know? <laughs> so it's like, I mean, I don't know. Well, like, I, think she, I think she caught a lot of, uh, of, of grief for that, that I, I don't think that 
Well, I'm not saying we should pile under. I just saw right, it go right, viral right. recently. I uh, actually, you know, myself, I got carried away in, in, in all of the grief that was being thrown at her. And, and I, at one point, reached out to, uh, you know, to just try to say, hey, like, I was fucking was... Uh, I'm not proud of how I handled this situation. I was I was a jerk and I contributed to it. And uh, we made we uh, made everything really nice. And now whenever I see Amy Schumer getting grief for that to this day, it just yeah. I, I don't like it. Like yeah. I don't think she deserves it, and and it bothers me. Yeah, because I mean the thing a lot of people were saying were that time is like, hey, fuck you for well, making fun of Ryan Dunn's death. And it's very clearly a joke about Steve-O. Right, but uh, at the time. And hearing him say that again, I do remember he d- he did not react that way initially. No, he didn't. Yeah, no, and I, I, he admits that. I gotta say, uh, listening to a lot of these uh, like podcasts and shit that I went through of Stevo's, because um, there was another incident with Jackass Forever where he tried essentially negotiating his contract through the public. Like he would do interviews and say things like listen, I think the movie needs me a lot more than I need it and shit like that because he wanted a better deal. Mm -hmm. And he went back and like, he owned up to it and apologized to Knoxville and was like, that was the wrong way to go about it. Like a lot of this shit he really owns. He seems like a respectable guy. Like I went, um, you know, came out of the uh, prep for this podcast, having a great deal of respect for Steve-O. Oh yeah. And, um, now, uh, but yeah, it was something Amy Schumer took a lot of shit for and didn't really deserve it. No, but it was right after the third movie, Jackass 3D, uh, where it's you know 10 years apart, which to me, and now obviously Jackass Forever came out 20 over 20 years after uh, the first season, which really speaks to I think it speaks to a couple of things a the you know longevity and um. What's the word I'm looking for? Essentially, it never it never gets old. The idea of like slapstick comedy like that. Right. It's the one thing that I think holds up through generations where much like, you know, I knew kids. I wasn't particularly one of them, but I knew kids who grew up with like their dad or grandparents showing them the three stooges mm-hmm. um, because it, it's an easy like a, it's an easy laugh for a kid. A kids can understand it and find it enjoyable. Jackass is kind of the same thing where maybe you're not going to show your six year old, but it, I think it will hold up in 30 years, you know? Oh, for sure. This, they'll never get old. Um, well, the, the men are, because if you listen to Johnny Knoxville talk, he talks the same way, like, uh, you know, like he's Dick Butkus or something. I was gonna like say. He's an old, an old lineman. <laughs> he sounds like junior Seau right before the end. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Steve-O literally says that he's like, I worry about his head. Like he's only got a few concussions left. Oh, he's had th- some brutal ones. Yeah. And uh, I, some of the worst ones were not even jackass related. It was bad grandpa. And then that other dumb movie he did yeah. where he really got hurt. And the, well, the thing I wonder too, is like my immediate instinct was, you know, Oh, those movies must've really raked in money because they were probably not that expensive to make. But then you look at some of the shit they did. Yeah. It's like, it wasn't, it wasn't cheap to make either. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, I mean, in, when they were on the show, I think Steve-O got like 10 grand a season. Like it was nothing. Oh, really? Because he negotiated for, I think he was asking for like 10 million or something for the movie. That makes more sense. Yeah. So luckily he ended up uh, getting paid, but we'll get to a man that didn't in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. Here we got um next clip is Bam getting kicked off Jackass forever. Oh, here we are. We're... <laughs> What a segue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is Bam was not involved in the movie and he had a lot of troubles similar to Steve-O. So if you watch Demise and Rise, mm-hmm. uh, the Steve-O documentary and listen to Steve-O talk to and about Johnny Knoxville and all the other guys that helped him get sober, uh, they were a tremendous help. And, you know, they really did everything they could by all accounts um, to make sure Steve was all right. And it seems like they did the same thing for Bam Margera, who seems even like deeper into addiction than Steve was, and thus was not quite as receptive. No, and uh, but just to point out, he was in one scene in the movie. 
Um, oh, was he? Yeah. So the scene when they're in the they're all dressed up as the marching band and they get on the uh, the the high speed <laughs> the high speed treadmill and get chucked into the wall. That's he, oh yeah, I heard them talking about that. He's yeah, yeah. yeah, he's in he's in that and he is credited in the credits. But well, that, thank God. But uh, it wasn't quite enough for Bam. And yeah. I, I I hope that you can understand that at a certain point, m- like specifically over the last few years, that it stopped being fun. It stopped being yeah. funny. It stopped yeah. being cool. It stopped being something that we want to give give you a high five for because we're like we've been watching you self destruct. We can also let the record reflect that when you had been kicked out of the movie, that I was like oddly, surprisingly, like campaigning to get you back in the movie. And we were so close, Bam. We we had it to a point where you yeah, had. Yeah, I remember. A, we were so close. I know. We, we had. I was like writing scripts for you. Be like, tell them this, say this, and it's going to help get you back in the movie. And we got you to a point where you yeah. had a Zoom call with Johnny Knoxville, Spike Jones, Jeff Tremaine, and that was specifically yeah. the call where they were going to make the decision. You were all but back in, and you got loaded and missed the fucking call. You you got loaded and no-showed the call, and, and they had to see you on well, social media. What happens was... Yeah, I didn't have a computer and I was rushing to Danny Way's house and well, just right, did but, chocolate. but they had to see you all wasted on social media the night before, so they knew exactly why you missed the call. And they were like, fuck, you know, we, we were this close to letting him back in, but he made the decision for us. And I was fighting I so think, hard uh, for you. I, 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 everything meant, meant for a reason, and I, I'm much better off not being in it. I, well, I'm they, happy to not be in it. I, did, that, I, I don't want to do that anymore. That, I don't want to be a part of it. I, I'm much happier without it. Why? Yeah, I mean, well, that's a... Uh, I've had friends who have kind of gone down that road with addiction. Mm-hmm. And it's just that's him like rationalizing it and everything and not wanting to really like own up to what he's doing because like Steve was trying to get through to him there. Right. And saying like, all you had to do was present yourself as professional in this meeting with guys, you know, and have known for 20 something years. Right. All you had to do is show up at this fucking meeting and you right away, you hear him trying to make excuses. And Steve was like, no, no, no. They saw you on social media out getting fucked up. Like, don't lie to me. We, there's evidence of it. Right. Exactly. And you know, so he's just like, he's in a world where I don't think he knows he's lying even, you know, um, I, he's just kind of like gone down that road and telling himself he doesn't want to be a part of it or anything. Cause I think he, on some level realizes, um, how bad he fucked up and it's just rationalization, but like, it is kind of a sad, the Ben Margera story is, kind of sad. Like if you look at some of the things he's done over the last few years, whereas like his, you know, uprising story is, uh, inspirational. Like right. the CKY was originally his sister's band. And I guess they were like an up and coming metal band or whatever. And he used, um, some of their songs in his videos that became, CKY. And then like you hear him talk like a real innovative businessman that saw an opportunity and took advantage of it and rose to being part of one of the most famous comedy franchises in the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. And now he's just kind of a, you know, a fuck up basically. Like it's kind of sad to watch, but. Yep, but um, recently he's sober as of the last I checked a couple weeks ago. So. Okay. Well, that's good. Hopefully, uh, hopefully he gets his shit together. Yeah, I know. But he did have, like you mentioned, uh, Viva La Bam, which was another successful kind of spinoff of Jackass. And I know a lot of the characters on that show became um, infamous for, for different reasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, what's next? Uh, that was the last clip we had. That was it. Yeah. That's pretty much the story of Jackass, folks. Um, like I said, there's a lot more, and maybe if you guys are interested, we can do um, some of the individual characters. Or Craig actually mentioned before the um, before we started recording that something good might just be like 
on Patreon going through some of their greatest hits, essentially some of the best like stunts and sketches that they did and things, which I think could make for uh, an interesting episode. So let us know if that's something you're interested in uh, message me on Twitter or uh, ideally message me on the Patreon. So we know you're, you really care, you know? Yeah. We love you. And where can you find that? It's at blindmike.net. That's the best place. Um, you'll find our link tree and thus all of our links there, Patreon and the, uh, gearhead and why are you laughing? Merch is up there. Um, but if you say Mike, you know, it's a rough economy. I don't have the money to support you boys. Is there any other way? Well, it's very simple. Go to Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever else you get podcasts and support the show by subscribing, uh, leaving five-star reviews, nice comments, likes, everything you can do uh, in that form. And we appreciate that as well. Um, and you can all, like I said, the last couple of weeks, we have talked about some real shocking, outrageous guys. And uh, there's no more shocking content than you get on very good show with uh, Colonel Craig Oconey <laughs> and his, and his merry men. Yes. So go to very for all the whacktastic content that they're putting out. Yeah, try the show out for free. If you like it, join the Patreon. Come on. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. We'll talk to you next time on Why Are You Laughing? <laughs> <laughs>